today. Welcome back to track two. Um, and next we have Steve Lee from Open Directive, and he's been cutting code for many years in many technologies, and currently focusing on open access, cognitive accessibility, and older users, mainly in webby tech. Yeah, but this is going to be much more hardcore than any of that. Uh, it's not going to be as exciting as Craig's. I'm also freelance, so if you're thinking of employing him, come and see me first and I'll tell you a few home truths. Oh, that's <laughs> 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 yeah, it's cheap. Oh, it's <laughs> right, okay. Um, probably, where should we start? Let's have a, um, so this talk, um, let's do a straw, po straw poll first. Um, anyone here use React? Okay. React isn't really reactive apart from its name, as, as we'll see in a minute. <laughs> Has anyone done any reactive programming at all? Okay. Uh, anyone done any function programming? Great stuff. We won't be talking about monoids in the class of functors or anything like that. It's just a little like functional programming. Um, so, so we've got to answer three questions here. Um, and, oh, I should say that if you've got any burning questions which are stopping you understanding, do interrupt me, although we keep my main questions to the end. Um, so we're going to cover what is reactive programming and with streams and Cycle.js. Um, and some of you are probably pretty close to that already. Uh, some of you haven't got a clue. <laughs> I'm not sure I have. Um, why should I care about it or should I be interested at all and how can I get started? So, oops, so this is okay. what we cover then is some reactive programming with streams. Um, and observables. I say that because there is another type of streams which is used um, in the web world, uh, which are, are not based on observables, they're quite different. Um, it's all about flowing of, of the media streams or st streams of information. Uh, Cyber.js we will cover as a way of uh, accessing uh, reactive programming. But as I said, we do a little functional, a little bit of some of the ES6. Is everyone familiar with ES6 plus syntax for JavaScript? You are with JavaScript programmers, hopefully. Good. Oh, well, I can skip over that stuff. We just use a few of the, the newer features. Um, and we'll cover virtual DOM and JSX. If you use React, you'll be probably happy with those as well. Okay, so what is reactive programming? Andrew Stoltz, who is, has been involved with reactive programming for a long time with the Microsoft RX uh, stuff, and also Creative Cycle JS, and also a new stream library that is equivalent to RX. JS, said basically that it's programming with asynchronous data streams. And that's the critical bit really, is the asynchronous. Modern applications are pretty complicated in, in terms of we're getting information in from all sorts of places in asynchronous manners, especially with front ends now. And you've got to orchestrate all that stuff. And, and reactive programming makes it a bit easier. Um, so what is a stream? That's the first question that comes out of it. Well, it's just a sequence of events, really, happening over time. So we've got time running left to right, and in order, some sort of events happen. Um, and they are sequenced, it's next, next, next. And the stream can complete, no more events after that, or there can be an error, no more events after that. That's it, really. Now, these streams flow between an observer and then, sorry, an observable, which generates events, and an observer. And, and in this case, it's a push semantic. So the, um, the, the observable on the left generates events, and anything that is observing it will get the events. Okay, that's it. Everyone happy with that? Basic concepts? Right, okay. And this is nothing new. I mean, if you're familiar with using an architectural scale, especially with enterprise solutions, you use event buses and queues. Um, at programming scale, you, you use event handlers. You don't really think of it as a stream. You tend to think of it, the user's clicked once. But there's actually a stream of clicks. Every time they click, you get an event. So it fits very well with, with that model. The Microsoft RS extensions, which are probably the first um, library that really encapsulated this particular model, um, have been around for about five years, a long time. Netflix are using them quite heavily for their um, their UI that you've probably used if you've used an Netflix surface. And Angular now, the latest version, is it four? I'll get lost with their numbering scheme. Uh, that now provides RX um, as an option. Okay, so I'm gonna start from the top and we'll work our way down and drill into some of the details. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not live coding either, but I, I did it a different way. I put it on slides because I didn't trust that anything was gonna work. <laughs> so we'll see how it goes. So Cycle.js, it derives Cycle.js describes itself as a functional reactive JavaScript framework for predictable code. The predictable bit really comes from the fact that it helps you orchestrate asynchronous and also it's using functional programming. 
Um, calling it a framework, well, it's a tiny amount of code. It really is. There's almost nothing there in the actual cycle JS itself. It just sets up a loop, <laughs> basically. Um, and it uses a small set of principles, uh, or general principles. They're quite flexible, which means it's applicable not just to front end code, but also you can use it in other applications. And maybe mention that bit at the end. Uh, Widdershin, um, guy in New Zealand, who's one of the co uh, core contributors of Cycle.js, recently in an article described it as a unified theory of everything but for JavaScript. And really, he was <coughs> coming to, if you use React, it, it handles a view and you might add Redux to give you the single flow and state, um, single state atom. Um, but, but apart from that, you don't get a lot of guidance for how to engineer or, or architecture your system. Uh, whereas Cycle, gives you a very firm model, and we'll see that in a minute, and that's what he was getting at. And it streams all the way down. Cycle is really a um, tiny bit of code, as I said, and everything else is streams, JavaScript, other stuff. It doesn't, there's not much to learn, although the little there is to learn is really the streams, and they can be a bit of a mind bender. And if in doubt, just remember, it's a stream. If you're wondering how you're gonna do something in Cycle, use a stream, that's it. <laughs> Okay, so what are the principles? Well, there's a single event loop between the application and the outside world. That's the first thing, I'm going to show a picture in a minute. The IO side effects, this is the architectural level side effects, not functional side effects, um, are completely separate in the code from the application logic. And that, that that uh, brings lots of advantages, especially around sort of bugs that you often get. And there's no global state. All there is really is data flows and we have reducer functions, which I'll, I'll cover a bit, bit more. There is a sort of effectively a global atom, but it isn't global state, which you modify from anywhere. You go through, um, well, we'll see in a minute. So here we are, here's, here's a cycle app. At the top, you have your component. We call it component because even your app is a component, <laughs> okay, itself. You have inputs, and, and when I started years and years ago, the, the first sort of structural diagram I saw was input processing output, and this is exactly what this model is. It couldn't be any simpler, really. So you have sources coming into the, your component, it processes them and generates outputs. The actual side effects, or the I.O., the interaction with the real world, happen below in drivers, and they're not... So you don't, in the middle of your code, you don't suddenly start modifying the, the, the DOM source or you don't suddenly start handling requests. You keep it quite, quite separate. Um, right, it's also composable. And, and those of you um, who read, read Gang of Four book on patterns, they say um, uh, prefer composition over inheritance. And so that's a good example here. Basically, your component uh, or app, uh, and your app can be a component, can contain other components. And all you need to do is basically wire up these uh, sources and sinks in, in, the, in the flow that you want. Um, and inside uh, a component, you've basically got data flow, or explicit data flow, which is very, very useful as well, especially when you've got lots of async things going on. And you say, well, that, if, if you're using a, a sort of object-oriented approach, um, an imperative approach, you find that you've got a bit of state here, a bit of state there, and you're trying to work out how the information's moving around for your system. Uh, that can be quite difficult to track sometimes. So we've got this explicit data flow. We also get the bonus of it's extensible. We, if we need some new functionality, we just add a new driver that deals with that one little thing. Drivers are quite simple and they tend to be quite granular as well. And it's relatively easy to test. And, and the reason for that is that you don't often need to do a lot of mocking because of the way state is handled. And also, as we see, um, you're pushing inputs into a black box and looking at the outputs. So it's often a lot easier to, to test. So, let's see some code. Here's our app, and there is a pastebook for this if you're at all interested in just starting off and hacking around with it. Couldn't be any simpler. We've got a toggle, an HTML toggle box, which you can click, and when you click on it, it changes on to off. Hi there, burning Hi. question. Can you throw your lanyard over your shoulder? All right, is it crackling? <coughs> yeah. Ah, sorry. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I didn't even notice that. <laughs> well, I'm going to take it off before it strangles me. <laughs> But the advantage of this is there's a nice little loop. There's an input from the outside world going to our code, which is processing it, and it updates the screen. So it fits in perfectly with our, our simple little model. Um, 
Okay, so first of all, like most JavaScript heavy frameworks, we don't have much static HTML, that's pretty much it. There's obviously the header at the top. Um, you basically just have a placeholder element which um, the code, the function, uh, the JavaScript renders into. Um, you also obviously need your dependencies. We normally in our code use um, ESX imports, ES6 imports, sorry, uh, usually via Babel or TypeScript now. Um, I, I personally prefer TypeScript, but I've gone over to it. Um, you can also use global scripts if you like, you know, the script tag. Um, this is great if you're just knocking something up and some, something like paste bin, um, JS bin, sorry. Um, and you can just use the MPN CDNs for that, for, for the modules, so that just works. Basically, the three, three modules that you need, dependencies that you need, are Xtreme, which is a library of observables and things that work on observables, uh, operators. Um, the cycle itself, this tiny little library that glues everything together and gives us the model we just looked at, and a driver. And here, there's a DOM driver, which we use. There's a factory function, which we call, um, well, I'll see in a minute. Um, so here we are, this is it, this is a cycle entry point. I mean, that is the cycle API, cycle.run. <laughs> That's all there is to it. Couldn't be much easier. What it does is you pass it a reference to your component, our main component I'm calling Toggle here. A naming convention is because we're not using classes, we can use capital letters for something else, so we use them for components. Um, and uh, that's just a function. So that's the normal reference to a function. The other thing we pass in <laughs> is a collection of drivers, um, which uh, the name is relatively important, and, it's, and in this case, it just causes the um, factory function passing it that HTML element that we want to render into. That's it. A little word about drivers then. Um, they're just functions. Everything's just a function and this stuff. Um, the output, I ought to have put the diagram in here, I haven't. The output um, of one of the, uh, the output goes to one of the component sources as we'll see at the moment. So a component will see the output of, of the drivers. In our case, we don't actually get a stream coming in straight away. What we get is a function which allows us to select the stream we're interested in. And the input to a driver is the output or the syncs from our components. Um, in this case, it's virtual DOM updates, or if you, if you want to think of it, it it's updates to the, the DOM document model to update our um, HTML. And Cycle connects the inputs and the outputs based on the name. So it, it, on the outputs, it, it, it syncs, it sees a DOM sync with, with the V nodes in, and it knows that that's related to the DOM events coming in. And that's really what the cycle is. It's just looping those two together to give you a nice circuit. So, oh, I did put the picture there again. So, yeah, so on the left, we have the sources coming in from the DOM, uh, it, and, and it's actually, the events don't come in straight away, you select which events you want, uh, from, and the thing goes out. Okay, so here's, our, here's a component, well a skeleton of a component. Again, it's just a function called toggle. It takes in the sources, which is just um, a collection of um, basically one per driver. Uh, and it returns another collection, or object if you, if you like, which is the sinks. And we, in this case, we're interested in the DOM inputs and we output DOM virtual nodes. And this is the actual whole function for doing the thing which I never demonstrated. <laughs> if you click on it, it updates it. Um, that's it, there's not a lot of code there. I, I'm not gonna go through it because I'm gonna break it down a bit into using a, a model which is a convention that we often use in Cycle. It's not necessary. I mean, are you all familiar with model view controller, presumably? It's a, you know, something from the 80s. Um, which has been <laughs> modified and made a mess of. But um, we use something, a variation of that called model view intent. And where I just showed you a whole main function which takes in the sources and chucks out the uh, sinks at the end, you can break that into three. The intent is what the user wanted to do in, in a, a user interface scenario. Um, the model, which is as in model view controller, it's your data, your state. And then the view, which takes that state and, and generates the, the output. Um, and those three are in a line because we've got a stream of data flowing through. It makes sense that they're actually you know, in, just in a straight line like that. Although inside, they might, they might be more complicated. Um, so here we are. Here's a function. So all I've done here is that I've created um, 
everything's very expression heavy because we're the functions, not statements. Um, so I've created three, var three variables, one called intent, intent dollar, and that's another naming convention, which I think we call Finnish, because Andre is living in Finland, like Hungarian notation, if any of you remember that, Charles Simonoi. Um, and the, you read the dollar as stream, so it's intent stream, model stream, and view stream, and we return the view stream. And I've taken, is everyone happy with destructuring? Object destruction, this isn't, is 2017, I think. Anyone want me to just explain that? Great, I'll skip over that one then. Right. So the user intent, I've just pulled out the bits from that function now. The, the user intent, what that says is we take the DOM input from the sources and we call the select function and we can just use CSS selectors. So I'm saying give me the, the input um, element, which is the toggle, it's input type toggle, um, checkbox, sorry. Uh, and then I want all the change events from that. So the result of that is that intent stream is a stream of events whenever the user clicks on that input. So if you remember that line thing, every time the user clicks on, on that control, um, we'll get a change event coming in. I should have put some more diagrams in actually. Um, one thing to note is all the input events come in through the sources. You may be used to putting, um, it's quite an old technique now, putting um, your handlers in line in your DOM or a description, but don't do that because we want a nice loop, um, which is something that you know, React and Red Redux have moved towards. Um, CSS selectors. Oh, one, one comp when you have composition, things get a bit complicated because you, in, in your bottom level components, you don't want to see events above. So some t there's a technique which provides isolation for nested components, but I'm not gonna go into that. So the model, that's our state. Well, our state is really simple. And in actual fact, the checkbox keeps state for us because it has a display and you can run, but, and you could read it if you want, but we don't do that. We simply get the events coming in and we keep track of our state based on those events. Um, our state is obviously true or false, checked or not checked. And we want to initially start with false because that's what the DOM does. And so there we have, we, we have um, very simple, we use our, we based on our intent stream, uh, we map, um, is everyone happy with the map concept function with um, the ar array extras? No, array.map, that's all right, okay, great. So it's exactly the same as that, but I'll come back to the subtle difference in a minute. And arrow function, fat arrow functions, everyone happy? Great, okay, good, this is easy. <laughs> um, so we basically, we take the event that's coming in from our intent stream, which is the DOM events, and we take from that the target elements check status and we just say, uh, we use another stream operator. I should say these are the extreme streams that we're, we're talking about here. We use another stream operator which says start with false. That's it, okay? So what you get out of that is a stream of true or false statements starting with false. And, oh, I can skip that. Right, so our view, which is very much like a React view, so it's the same um, sort of concept, um, takes the, uh, the model stream and maps it, and we take the toggled state, we can give it any name you like, we just got a series of true false values coming through at this point. And we use um, whatever method you want to update the DOM. Um, is anyone not happy with using DOM fragments like this in the virtual DOM? Can you just back up for a minute? Yeah, where to? Uh, there. there. Where yeah. does sinks come from there? Where does Oh, sorry, I've just cut a load of code out to, um, you, you'll see in a minute, okay. So, um, sinks is oh, something... so you're showing the first step of the process. Well, this is the middle step, actually. Work. The first step was in, it was generating the intent. Okay. Okay, this is just... Sorry, um, oops, how far being down. No, no, don't worry. Um, so, there we go. The first line generates the intent for, by selecting the DOM events we're interested in, and we sign that to a constant. The next step is we take that constant um, and extract or pluck, as is the terminology, the check status and start with false. And then the next step uh, is the view, and that creates sinks and returns it. I, I mean, that, I've used variables, I should have said constant sinks, sorry, that's. <laughs> um, just to make it a little bit more documented. Obviously, you could just return a, a literal object, DOM colon view stream, if you like, but. Sorry, but, I lost that it was all happening in one function. Okay, so you're happy now? I'm happy. Brilliant. Okay, so, so the view is just um, a bunch of code which generates um, 
Sorry, what I was saying is everyone happy with the VDOM con virtual DOM concept and, and the way it does diffs and etc. etc. Anyone want me to unpack that a bit? Which of your imports originally provided the function div? Oh no, wait. Oh, I see you're constructing it. Yes, this is code which is constructing the DOM based on the value of something I call toggle, which is yeah. the true false state. But div is provided by. Right, yeah, I, I haven't shown that level. If, uh, we go back to the other function, which I'll do in a minute. I've, I've just cut stuff out. That's imported from the DOM driver. Okay. Now, um, I don't know, those of you who react, you know, there's a create element. The, the, um, we're using something called Snabon here, which is another virtual DOM one. It has a constructor called create, I um, can't remember what it's called, effectively creates a DOM element, a virtual DOM element. Um, you could call that each time passing in the element you want. I want a div. Uh, I want I want uh, an input. I want a paragraph. But the, there's a, there are a bunch of functions which are simply named for each of the elements you want, which is what I'm calling here. These are usually called. Um, do, I, do I mention that? Um, yeah, I'll go for it. Th these are usually called hyperscript helpers. Um, now you can use these if you like. I'm quite happy to use this functional style to generate my HTML. Um, to me, it's just a slightly different syntax. If you look at, that's the code and that's the HTML that's generated. It's just syntactic sugar, really. The structure's the same. Some people don't like that and they use JSX, which is perfectly supported. Anyone want to know what JSX is? <laughs> <laughs> Unholy child of two different things. <laughs> okay, um, let me just back up a bit. Um, yeah, so I'll come back through the whole process in a minute. Any questions? So, no, everyone knows virtual DOM, so I won't go into that either. Oh, this is great, I'm cutting out loads of stuff. Yeah, yes, it's template strings, everyone's happy with them? Brilliant, they are, All right. Okay, so let's just step back a bit. That code I showed you, and, and think of it in terms of the stream that, that's um, happening, the stream of events. And I've just broken it down really, just taking out all the clutter. We start off with a stream of DOM events, which we select from the DOM driver. We say what we're interested in. We then convert each of those to the check state that's coming in. And, and then we start with false. And then finally, we map that to a chunk of DOM update, which then gets passed back to the driver and that updates the DOM. Okay. Everyone sort of, anyone feeling a bit, what's going on here yet? <laughs> that's good. So just to summarize streams, so an explicit flow of events and they run from the source in our component they run from the sources the input they're manipulated and they squirt out the end to the sink to the consumer so it's producer consumer sort of thing going on there and through a sim sequence of very simple operators like map reduce if you're familiar with big data stuff um, or the array options map filter um, yeah reduce again so one thing to notice about this is it's very declarative code Okay, the stream set operators say what happens, you change this to that, you filter this, okay. It's not how, you'll notice there's no for loops, <laughs> none, none of that rubbish, so it's very much steps. So it makes it a lot easier to debug, and, 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 but it's a different approach, it's like using SQL, which is declarative, so SQL, compared to you know, normal um, imperative code, as it's often called. And it also uses functional um, style operators in the stream, which I've just touched on, there's map and reduce, or fold generally called now, and filter, um, um, nothing else. And there are a few extra, there's quite a bunch of operators available like merge, which, here we go. Something called marble diagrams. If you look at the, the cycle documents are very good. If you look at the RX documents, they are horrendous. And this explanation of merge is just, whoa, loads of verbiage. This really simplifies and gives you a nice visual indication of what this operator is doing. And it's actually an interactive site called rxmarbles.com. Doesn't cover every single operator, but and some of the more complicated ones are, are not there yet. But hopefully you can see very clearly that if you've got two streams which have different sequences of events in them, merge simply gives you the interleaved result of that. Remember, this is time going along here. So we get the 20, we get the 40, we get the 60 on one stream. Then the second stream gives us a one. So then our output that happens straight after the 60. Okay, and there's other operators like that. Um, okay. Also, there's a lot of immutability going on. Everyone happy with that? Okay. So, um, the operators all return a new stream. They don't modify the stream in place. Um, the, the functions that you're using in the operators are pure functions, so there's no side effect surprises going on. And there's no modification of global state. 
brings us on to state. State is the one thing that people are looking at cycle th uh, or um, uh, observable streams think, well, how do you manage this? But it boils down to three ways. One is the follow events thing, which we saw. I, the, basically, the stream comes in and we just use the, uh, our state is what the last event was. <laughs> okay, dead simple. Um, alternatively, you can use fold or, fold or reduce, which basically, um, if you use reduce, then it goes on an array, it goes through the whole set and then gives you, the, uh, you get the final result. Um, obviously, you can't quite do that with streams which are happening over time because you don't know when the next event's going to come. But it works the same way in that it, you, you use a uh, reducer function which takes the current state, so the operator keeps state of what the last state is that you've set, and the new event that's come in, and you provide the new state back, which is what you get the next time. So this allows you to, over time, change the state but all in the confine of the stream. There's no, there's no data over there which you're modifying sometimes, and data there you're modifying the other time, and then you can't remember who's modifying what. And so it's still done very explicitly within the stream. We've got something else called onionify. Onion, uh, onion as in layers of, <laughs> layers of an onion. Um, this was initially a sort of an experiment to see how we could handle a state nicely. It's very much like Red Axe in that there's a single tree of your state. Um, and e each component just sees its subpart. Of, if you've got sorry, if you've got nested components, each component just sees its subpart. Um, so it's layered to match that composition structure. Um, the state input to your component is just a stream of state values. Um, this is it's just a, a structure, a nested structure array. So it's by reference. So it's all you know. There's no inefficiency of copying going on there. Um, so you get in, into your component, you get an event saying, here's the latest state, whenever it changes, and you can ignore that or do something with it. And on the output, you provide one of these reducer functions, which basically says, um, and, and because we're functional, we can return a function. We don't return data. We return the function that operates on the state when it needs to, uh, which basically says, um, given this initial state and this new value, here's the, here's the output state. All very functional and clean. Um, if you like, and what you might do if you're in a browser context, you persist that in local storage. And there's another little wrapper function called storify. It seems to be a convention that it's an if I, if it's a wrapper rather than a, a component. But there's a, there's a storage, storage if I, which just saves that data automatically for you in local storage. Or you can roll with your own state mechanisms. You might always want to just store stuff straight into local storage. Uh, if you're not in a browser, you store it in the database or, or something. So, Right, summary, how are we doing for time? How far is right. So, a component is a, is a, um, a function and it gets streams. Um, there are no side effects at the architectural level, anyway, and certainly at the functional level. Um, immutable and pure. So, if you're, you're used to these concepts and you see the advantages of them in some cases, I'm not saying they're the answer to everything, um, then you get those benefits as well. Uh, the side effects are kept in the drivers, so you know exactly where changes to the world or your data are going to happen. Um, not in the main code. The main code then is pure and, and can be tested easily, without, usually without a lot of mocking. Um, the, and just recapping that flow, really, the intent is what the user wanted to do based on some input events. You use your model to track the state changes over time, and then your view just ma maps your current state to the, the DOM content. Um, and the V nodes get squirted back to, for rendering. Um, there we go, there's a summary again of, uh, of what the app looks like. Um, what about those observables? I didn't really mention them, did I? We didn't see any in the code. Um, and this is the strength of cycle. If, if, if you use something like Angular, you can say, well, I'll use a, bit of, I'll use a stream here, and I'll use a stream there. And it's very easy to shoot yourself in the foot and get in a right old mess. Cycle gives you a very clean model. The observable and the observer live in the drivers. The rest of your code is just processing the stream from one back to the other. Um, and and I, I personally really like that because I tend to think that way. I've started off in communications and, and I've done lots of events and programming, and to my mind, it, it fits. <laughs> but um, and, and the, the, the drivers act as the uh, interface between the, the observables in the drivers act as the interface between the stream 
and the, and the uh, side effects of the outside world that you want. Um, and often the drivers have normal imperative code, not, not this declarative approach, so you'll see four loops and all sorts of stuff. Um, and extra, I don't know what I was saying. Oh yeah, the, the reason for creating the Xtreme library and not using RxJS, which and, and, uh, Andre was actually a, a core committer to that project, was there's something called hot and cold, which I won't go into, but it affects the way things streams work and gave a lot of surprises in, in a, in, a um, in the context of a browser where you expect things to, to happen immediately. Um, so the extreme by default is always this thing called hot. Which is only decent, maybe this works as you expect. That's the main reason. Um, the observable pattern that we're talking about here. Um, there is an observer, oh, you know your gang of four, there's an observer, and it's actually, I'll jump ahead there, it's actually, uh, this observable pattern is actually a combination of the observer, I, something's watching something, if that changes, the observer knows about it, um, and the iterator pattern, um, which you get with array, so there's the, you know, one event, next event, next event, um, and the, you actually see in the drivers, as I'll look at in a minute, you see next, as an explicit um, thing that you call. Um, da, 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 da. So it's a pub sub sort of thing, publish subscribe. Right? One thing publishes events, and whoever subscribes gets to know about it, it's push. And there is also an ECMAScript um, TC39 stage one proposal for observable as well. It's been there a while, I don't know where it's going. <laughs> so you may see it in the browser that one day, or in those. And actually, Stream has been written. Um, Xtreme, the, the library, and so Cycle has been written to work with various observable streams. So it'll work with Rx, it'll work with Xtreme, and it should work with the DOM specific one as well. So you should be able to have code that works across them all. Drivers, okay. Here's a really, really simple driver. Um, I call this a right only driver. What it does is you, it looks at the stream coming into it, and whenever it sees something, it logs it to the console. Couldn't be easier, yeah. Um, it's just a function. Um, the observer is something uh, is a listener in, in the language of Xtreme, and so we simply got an observer, which whenever and, and describes a function, which takes a message and logs it, and that's called whenever an event comes in, because the listener calls the next event. Okay, that's simple. But as you can see, that's doing all the side effects. The, the side effect of being logging to the outside world. There's none of that in, in your main code. And the opposite is a read-only driver, and here's a very sort of contrived example. If you've got stuff coming in from a web socket, you want to squirt that in to your cycle components so that it knows that an event's come in and here's the, the data. And all it does, um, forget about the sort of boilerplate stuff, you obviously create a web socket, and uh, whenever the web socket kicks off a non-message event, we simply call next on the stream. So that the squirt through anything that comes into the WebSocket goes into the stream as their next event over time. Um, okay, so let's just finish off. Having shown you all that, and it's very easy when I tell you this, and obviously I've shown you the simple stuff, not all the tricks and traps that there are. <laughs> um, there is a learning curve to this, and you sometimes feel like you need a brain rewiring because it is a very different way of thinking. You're not saying do this. Um, and how you do it, you're just saying, here's these events coming in through. So you can see really weird if you're only used to classical OOP style. Um, um, as I said, the new idioms and traps that you have to learn, and, and the methods of state handling are quite different as well. Um, having said that, it's much easier than just using the streams if you use cycle, as, as I touched on before. Um, there's many ways, if you just sort of add streams into other bits of code, then you can get in the right mess. You need to know what the good patterns are. Um, I think I'll say there. Okay, why bother? Well, here's some examples. It explicitly handles asyn complex asynchronous orchestration problems. Um, and even just using sync, it can be simpler than long promise chains. Everyone used to those horrible things. <laughs> and, and, and admittedly, async await makes that a lot easier. Um, but one thing I haven't put there is you can actually cancel streams. You can, it has cancel semantics. You can't cancel um, promises. Once you've got the promise going, it, it will uh, resolve. Um, the code, depending on your, your personal preferences, I guess, it is clean and declarative code. It's just you know, steps one after the other, more often than not. Um, and you end up having streams coming in, you merge them together to generate new, new streams. 
Um, uh, functional code gives you predictability, and the pure code, as I said before, is much easier to test. And you might even like it, I do now. Having, having used this for a while, I keep finding it much cleaner and easier and want to go back to it when I'm, I'm hacking normal imperative stuff. And something I think we've seen, and there's a lot of interest on the back end now with serverless. I don't know if you've come across it, but that's a bit driven. Um, rather than you manage a server loop in Express or something, uh, you have create a function which the system calls for you. So it's, it's like a, a root handler in Express but the system take care of all of that. And that, as that's event-driven and you want to do processing, I can see that this could possibly become something that's used there. Why not? I've got to do this, haven't I? <laughs> it takes effort to internalise these new concepts. Well, that's the same with everything. You got, you got to, the only way to learn, you can read all you like, but you've got to start playing with the code. Right? And, and then you, you start, ah, I understand now. And it's still relatively young and being refined, that cycle. And, and, the, and some of the stream concepts are the best ways of um, architect, uh, orchestra, um, yeah, architecturing things hasn't really been sorted out in a few cases. Um, but that's the advantage in a way, because it's flexible. Cycle is so tiny, it leaves things open. You've just got these basic principles, which I've shown you, and you can style your code and, and, and refactor in all sorts of different ways. It's up to you. Debugging can be tricky, because all existing debuggers, obviously, they step in the imperatives, so or they go around the for loop and show you the variables. If you've got things this squirting down these sort of streams, it can be hard with existing tools to see what's going on. Um, what you often end up doing is just putting in a debug operator which has a side effect, oops, <laughs> of logging to the console so you can get some visibility in what's going on. That feels very sort of old fashioned. Um, there are some tools we worked on which will take a, a, um, a bunch of stream code and, and give you a graphic diagram and even animate it. So that, that can help a lot. Um, it's got like the time traveling debugger and oh, you've seen that, have you? Yeah, yeah that's something Winnish indeed. Um, yes, and that's also part of it, and, and that, that ties in with um, hot module reloading as well. If, if you're familiar with that, so yeah, yeah that's, that's that's very good. Um, yes, that's a tool which lets you basically you get a time slider at the back, and that's that's another side effect of the way this works. Um, and you could do something similar with Red Hat. So I think there is time traveling for that as well, because you've got state encapsulated and state changes over time and everything else comes off the state, the view, you can um, take a snapshot of your state at various points in time and slide backwards and forwards and, and the whole app changes, so, um, which is great when you see it, it's absolutely glorious. Um, finding developers can be hard, very hard at the moment, unless you work for Netflix <laughs> and a few other companies. Um, and sadly, even FP itself, let alone streams, is not really taught, it's not really that familiar. Pe people who are interested in it um, tend to do it self. Um, it's ancient. I mean, Lisp, gosh, how old is that? Emacs, yeah, no moment. <laughs> it's full of Lisp, you know, that sort of style of lambdas and uh, <laughs> going back a long way. <laughs> um, but it's not mainstream. The oop swallowed the world, it seems, at one point. And, and it's the cycle uh, and um, Sort of, um, streams community is still quite small, but that's good. <laughs> it's one of those, it's, it's the pro and it's the con. You know, having a small, active, dynamic, friendly, interactive community is great, but it does mean that you know, the worries about it's long-term, they've got some ways of addressing that. So it's long-term sustainability and all those sort of issues. How can you start? Well, th there is a, like um, React, there's a Create Cycle app program, which you can provide different flavors to create, and the one you want to use is one fits all flavor. Uh, there's a new version, it's on a fork at the moment, I'm sorry, on, on a branch at the moment. Uh, there's a really strange Uglify bug that you can't, can't figure out. Um, that basically creates an SPA, which is quite a common thing that people, sorry, single page app, <laughs> which is a common thing people want to do with different, different each page is a component, of course, <laughs> with streams going in. There's a router, as you normally have in, in these things, uh, which routes the streams through to the right places. Um, so, and it's got a little driver, a little speech driver, uses the web speech API. Um, the cycle docs and samples are very good, you know, some, some of the best, they, the, the notable, notable, yes, that's how I say that. And Stoltz wrote a book, The Introduction to Reactive Programming You've Been Missing, and you, um, at the time, the main documentation was the Rx documentation, which was oh, horrendous, very Microsoft-y. <laughs> so, um, so you really want to read that if you're at all interested in that, because it, it, it covers 
uh, not the cycle stuff, but it covers the streams, how they work, in, 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 in a really clear, he's got a bit of a gift for explaining it. He's got, do you know Egghead I.O., you guys? Brilliant, absolutely love it, it's my favourite learning resource. It's, sm it's a course of small, um, broken into small chunks, each chunk is an interactive uh, live coding example. Um, it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, Stoltz has done a couple on Cycle, on RX. Um, they're all worth watching. I'd say all the courses on <laughs> Egghead are worth watching, to be honest. Um, and the community is really helpful uh, issues and uh, on GitHub and Gitter. I don't know if you know that. It's, it's, um, it's somewhat integrated with GitHub, but it's just a chat thing like IRC, really. Um, I think that's it. Yes, that's it. Whew, talked a lot. Probably you're all going, oh, what was that? Because it's, it's a new concept there, and some not so new concepts. Questions, I'm back already. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. The, the, the devil in the details bit about this is always that touch point between the pure and the impure. Yeah. <laughs> Can you just back up for a minute and just yeah. show, I, do. I think you, through the concept of drivers is where the impure, pure interface That's a, is example code. Is that say. correct? Just yes. curious where... Yeah. Where in the flow of the code does that touch point occur between the pure and the impure? Yeah. But, well, but it happens. from a testing, because you say it's easy to test okay. because it's pure, but there's obviously the impure. Yeah, that's a good way to show you. Where is the touch point? Okay, the touch point impure? is the boundary of the component um, or the driver <laughs> because they're just wired up straight into the, in the loop. Let me, let me back up. Okay, so um, all of this is pure code streams. So pure functional code, mm -hmm. um, and a stream. A, um, there's one. There's, what you return is a, is a collection of streams. Each stream is wired up automatically by cycle to the right driver. Okay, so your streams go to. In this case, you've only got one. So the the pure stream, have, the stream is manipulated. It comes out to the, the driver, and the driver then does the side effect of updating the the DOM. Okay. So all, all the code that knows how to use virtual DOM, in actual fact, that's a library we use. So we don't write all that code yourself as usual. And it's important to say, there's almost no dependencies in here. It's just stream code, JavaScript. Here, here's where all you, you know, you're doing all your imports and, and calling all your libraries and, and all the complex dependencies. Um, and then the other touch point is, is here. So, so yeah, probably here and here are the, the touch points. So the streams are going through, and it's the code in the driver that then becomes impure. And on the other side, um, the impure code becomes streams, which become pure. Does that answer it? Well, I'm just curious because of your comment about it being easy to test because the code is pure. Right, okay, so... But the impure code seems inextricably part of the... What, what, you part of what it is the, you're trying, what part of the end, you, you know what I'm saying, I'm just Well, the, dri the, the drivers are just functions, okay, so that's quite good. They do have side effects, so they will write to the DOM, which makes it harder to test. You need something that can look at the DOM and check it's updated correctly. But what you're squirting into it is just a stream of events. Okay, so you can automate that, it's quite easy to test. So it's events in, and then you look at the side effects using whatever method you want oh, to I use, head, whether it's headless, engine or whatever, you know, a browser, whatever. Um, taking snapshots, comparing them, whatever mechanism you want to use for testing. To test this, you just squirt stuff in and see what comes out. There's no side effects in there. You don't have to, you don't have to create objects which have states. There's no dependencies, so you don't have to create all the things you normally mock with their pretend state. You just squirt stuff in and see what comes out. So the pure part is the input stream relationship. Yes. Not, yeah. the what, not the what you then do with the stream, which is unavoidably impure. Yes, that's right. Okay. Yeah. So, so your stream definition is just a bunch of function functions in the functional programming sort of way, which is pure by definition. Yeah. <laughs> so the fact that you're you're going through a stream is just going through one pure operator after the other. So, given with known, with known given inputs, you get given outputs, but you have to take into account time because something like the fold operator may. It depends on the order of events, so you've got that extra complexity. It's not static, you know, with these inputs. If I've got an add function, I put A and B in, I get C out. <laughs> like always. Um, it might depend on the order that things happen. But the driver is almost inevitably changing the stream. Isn't it? Um, 
Yes, it depends on the type of stream it is. That's, that simple log one never ever generates a stream. It never gives an input. It simply has a side effect of logging to the console. <laughs> Does that answer that? Well, no, but I mean, if the driver is also responsible for virtual DOM updates, yeah. then it's affecting the stream. Uh, indirectly, we try and break that because um, obviously the events that you might get in depend on what the DOM is. If you take, get rid of the toggle button, you're never going to see the change event. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's a closed system. I mean, everything affects everything else to some extent. <laughs> Did I answer that? Any, any other questions? Oh, no, it's gone. From a purely code structural point of view, if you're merging two streams and, and, uh, and handling that, yes. do you not often find yourself splitting it again? It's, it's like I, I, I'm dealing with a bunch of things here, mm, yeah. but actually I need, I need a big switch. It's like that stuff does this. Yes. That you stuff does tend not to use a switch, so you can. Yes. Yeah. yes, you can. And, and one of the ways of doing that is where I have the constant expressions. Um, I really have to find an example. Um, where's the code? Oh, gone too far. Um, let, let's find that. You do that with your filters. There we go. Uh, yeah. Yes, that is, it's quite right. That, that's one way. Um, I was going to say, you, each, each of these is a, is a separate stream, and, and they relate to each other. In this case, it's a really simple flow, straight line. Okay? The, Model depends on the intent, the view depends on the model, so straight down. <laughs> you could, I could create model two, which also works on intent, um, and does something quite different. Mm. Oh, right. So that's, so that's forked. <laughs> or, or the way that you said, you can use filter, and you can say, well, I just want the, um, the, uh, the um, true events in one stream and the false events in another stream. You, you so could do then, that as well. Oh, I see. So then you'd actually, you'd then create two things. Be, yes, you have to be a little bit careful when you end up having a sort of diamond pattern, things yeah. can get a little bit messy due to effectively race conditions. And it's not quite that simple, but that, that's a bit of an anti pattern. You try and avoid that. <laughs> okay. Well, your sinks at the bottom is an array, isn't it? So you yep. could be doing multiple models, multiple views, and then returning an array. Yeah. Of <laughs> Okay, so let, let's say that um, you have a on, on the input events coming in, um, we want to do two things. We want to update the DOM, as I showed you in the example, and we want to speak the state, true, false, on, off. Yeah. You, you just create two drivers. You've got the DOM driver already, and the speech driver is trivial. It's almost like two lines of code. <laughs> just calls the API. Um, and you just fork, basically. You, you, so, so your collection of drivers at the out, sorry, your collection of sinks, um, you have one that says it's DOM colon, um, mm -hmm. what do they call it, intent, yeah, I think that's the right one, and then speech stolen intent. Cycle makes sure that they get rooted to, through to the right place. So you fork within here, in, in our main component, which is where it should be, because you're declaring, declaring what you want to happen, and then cycle roots it through to the right drivers, and the drivers then have the effect that you want to in the world. So, so you had a question. I think you answered one of them. The other ah. one was that it looks like when you're writing a component um, <coughs> and you're wiring it up to uh, different streams and different drivers, mm. uh, does that mean that components end up written against particular drivers very much? So um, people are writing against the DOM driver all the time. And so when you're sharing components, you're kind of locked to that? Or do you have to transform those streams if you want? Do no, if, if you like, there's, 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 there is an implicit API. Yeah. Um, it's not documented. The, the, the API is what streams you take in. It is sort of documented, which is why rather than passing sources in, yeah. I've done the destructuring because that says I want to use the DOM so, driver. Yeah, so you can, and then you in can return, what you return is, there, is I'm returning some DOM updates. Yeah. Yeah. So it's fairly explicit. Yeah. But, but yes, um, if you want to use my component, you need the DOM driver. Fair enough, it does DOM stuff. <laughs> yeah. Is that, is that all the questions? Anymore? Great. Well, hopefully you've had... Oh, one more. Go on. uh, well, yeah, one quick one. Um, comparing it to something like React, I think a lot of people are familiar with, and oh, the yeah, yeah. sort of simplicity of having this atomic state, put that in, you get it out. Yeah, but that's Redux, that that's not well, yeah, Redux. Well, Redux. Yeah, it's Redux. That yeah. mental yeah. model, is it just... Does this confuse it, or do you find it's just as easy? You can still have that mental... Got it clear. It is still there. Okay, so you. this is your view, your, your Redux. 
you've got your props, or, or not, the, what's the other one, I, I forget. Um, I, I didn't like Redux, but when he had the pure functional components, I got more interested in it. <laughs> but, um, React, sorry. Um, so to some extent, I mean, here's your inputs, or your state, and, and you're just mapping that to the current view. You've got a loop, which is what Redux tries to give you with React, isn't it? So you don't get this complexity of, oh, they had a particular bug, didn't they, in Facebook, which they tried to fix. And, and having this single flow rather than two-way data binding, which causes absolute chaos. Um, you've got state, you know, you've got this flow of um, state come, um, intents come in, your model changes and that generates your view, and you just do that loop. Um, what's different is the fact that you've got this stream thing going on. It's a, it's a different way of thinking. It's not static, here's the props. <laughs> It's, here's a stream of props which change over time. And it's just like the arrays, really. And one of the things people have said is that whereas the array extras iterate over memory, i.e. the array elements, um, these iterate over time. So it's just a bit of a jump. But it's such a different way of thinking that it takes quite a while to get into it, especially if you get to my age. It took me a while to just sort of get it. But, but I was lucky because I've done a lot of communication event driven stuff. I was a um, message driven passing sort of stuff. I, I was almost there. It's just um, actual implementation. So, so that's the difference. The structure is much the same. It's just that it's explicitly a data flow. It's not um, um, some parameters which make something look a certain way. <laughs> that helps. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay, Thank brilliant. You. Well, I hope so. Oh.